Chapter Seventeen of The Lady in Blue by Augusta Groner, translated by Grace Isabel Colbron. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mueller drops the false trail. Neither spoke for some time. Mueller sat motionless, his saddened eyes staring out ahead, seeing nothing. Behind them, the keen brain was battling with a heart that rebelled against what it would not, but must, believe. Faulkner sipped the tea that had grown cold, and gazed now and then at his companion. His own thoughts were busy. Out of them he spoke, finally. But I don't see why Walross should go to all that trouble and expense, and racking his own nerves besides, just to find out why she did it. That isn't the question here. He wants to find out who did it. Elise Lehman did not kill herself. Faulkner gave a sharp exclamation. But the papers said— yes press and public took it for a case of suicide and they will never know any better if i can help it the last words were spoken very low and sadly as muller passed his hand wearily across his forehead but i know and a few others know i am telling you because i owe you an explanation and an answer to your question of some few minutes back just before louisa came you asked me why i thought i might need the man i sent away do you remember yes yes well he was a secret service man and he was waiting for orders that i might give him to make an arrest but i sent him away as you see for i had been mistaken there would be no arrest again Wagner paled then he shook himself impatiently and looked straight at muller and you said something about a dagger did you mean could you possibly think Wagner sprang from his chair and leaned forward threateningly toward the sad-eyed old man opposite steady there steady said muller calmly but with a note of real sympathy in his voice i told you i had been mistaken please sit down faulkner sat down mechanically as if in obedience to orders more than of his own volition but how did you ever why should anyone think that i my god why should i do such a crazy thing i never was quite convinced that you did it but you suspected me you came here to hound me please don't feel so bitter about it many another honest man has come under suspicion without half the evidence against him that there was against you. What evidence? You were Elise Lehman's lover at one time. You said things to Baron Walroth which you thought would prevent his marriage to her, but they only resulted in a duel. You were absent from the Mantini Pension, secretly, from May 27th to May 31st. Faulkner half rose, then fell back into his chair. How did you discover that? it is my present business to find out where any former lover of elise Lehman was on may twenty ninth the day she was killed replied muller i do not yet know where you were on that day but i do know that you have been more nervous more upset and irritable since that day even than your ill health would warrant still i do not suspect you now of having killed elise Lehman. therefore it is no business of mine where you spent those days Wagner gnawed his lip in silence for a moment then he spoke harshly with a sudden outburst. I went to Verona those days and spent most of my time trying to keep my younger brother from taking his own life. I am very, very sorry if I have called up sad memories, said Mueller softly. It is one of the hardest things my work compels me to do, inflict suffering on the innocent. I owe it to you, and you upset me so that you wrung the story out of me. The boy had gotten into trouble, bad company, gave notes with my father's name on them, a band of notorious forgers got him in their power under the guise of money-lenders muller gave a sharp exclamation and Wagner paused and looked at him yes yes i know said the detective the law has its eye on those people and i was to take up that case but put it aside when baron walroth sent for me but rest assured when i do take it up they will be brought to justice there's many another rash lad in their power yes i imagined it robert is inexperienced and young but it's all settled now thank god i made him go back to vienna and tell the president of the bank all about it we want to save my father any annoyance and excitement he is very ill muller nodded with a glance of sympathy you see it was a good thing we met after all for now when i take up the case against those forgers his voice dropped low and i fear i shall be able to do that very soon your brother can give me valuable information but will you help me now tell me something about the lures Faulkner opened his lips as if to speak, then suddenly started and gazed sharply at Mueller. There was another pause. Then he laughed suddenly. Mueller raised his head and asked, What are you laughing at? 
Wagner still smiled as he replied, I was laughing at my own foolish thoughts. When you asked me about the lores, and when you described Tony a few minutes back, I suddenly wondered why you wanted to know about them. Then I realized how perfectly absurd was the idea that Tony, Mrs. Lore, could have anything to do with the layman murder. Anyway, you're looking for a man, aren't you? And even if you knew that it was a woman who committed the crime, it couldn't by any possibility be that woman. Yes, the thought is absurd, said Mueller slowly, but please tell me all you know of them. I have nothing but good to say of them, but if I hadn't, neither you nor anyone else should ever hear a word from me that could possibly harm them. Mueller smiled. You're so fond of them? Faulkner nodded. He was my school chum. He is still my friend, in spite of the fact, or possibly because of it, I mean because he is so entirely different from me. And I'm still in love with his wife, and always shall be, in the very best way. So if you want to hear good of those two people, you can question me all you like. I do, replied Mueller, with a strange smile. I want to hear every possible favorable thing you can say about them. We used to call Hubert Don Quixote at school. Those who weren't quite so well acquainted with literature contented themselves by saying that he was crazy. Possibly he was, as far as any creative artist is crazy. I remember when he beat one of the boys black and blue because he had made an indecent caricature of an old apple woman who had a stand outside the school. And another time when our history professor made a rather slurring remark about Schiller's rewriting of history, Lore exclaimed aloud, God bless him for that. Where would we be without ideals? Most of the boys hooted, but the professor rose, went to Lore's bench, and shook his hand. I could tell you a hundred such stories, and Hubert Lore hasn't changed in the slightest. His quarrel with his benefactor, the late Baron Walroth, was quite characteristic of him. It was Baron Walroth who helped him to study and sent him to the conservatory. Mueller nodded. Yes, I've heard that. What was the trouble between them? Lore's whole life is an expression of gratitude to the Walroth family, and yet he refused to sell himself even to please his benefactor. It was this way. The Baron had a friend, a rich businessman whose only daughter and heiress fell desperately in love with Lore. Hubert's mighty good-looking. Her father had never refused her anything she wanted before, so she thought, of course, he could buy this husband for her. The Baron thought it would be a wonderful thing for Lore to come into so much money, and the girl was extremely pretty, although very self-willed, so he wanted to help it along. But Lore refused to have anything to do with it. He didn't like the girl, and he was too honest to buy himself a career on such terms. "'That was great!' exclaimed Mueller. "'He must be a real man.' He is indeed, continued Wagner, but it cost him Baron Walroth's friendship. Hubert was sorry for it, too. Still, he could not accept such a marriage. But I know that he was very unhappy, and that his most ardent wish was that some opportunity might come for him to show his deep and lasting gratitude for the Walroth family. Does he still see anything of the family? asked Mueller. Since the old Baron's death, the Baroness and Edmund invite him occasionally to one of their musical evenings. Does his wife go with him? No, I don't think so. I remember he told me once that when he did take Tony to introduce her to the Baroness after their marriage, the lady was rather cool toward her. She may not have approved of making a friend of a singer, but that only proves she didn't know Tony Lore. Did Baron Edmund know Mrs. Lore? I don't think so, said Wachner. He may have seen her once or twice. I'm not sure. Hmm, murmured Mueller. Then it wasn't so daring, after all. Aloud, he said, Mr. Lore is a mountain climber, isn't he? Yes, said Wachner. It's his favorite exercise. He has conquered several of the most dangerous peaks. And he is left-handed? He was, that is, he has trained himself to use both hands, on account of his piano playing. But in unguarded moments he is very apt to use the left hand. Why do you ask this? Wachner moved uneasily as he spoke the last words. And he is a composer, continued Mueller, with a certain sad persistence. Faulkner's eyes shone. He is a composer of eminent ability. Yes, said Mueller. He is a true creative artist. But let's talk of something else now. Here comes your sister. Mila von Weidner came quickly through the now rapidly filling room, came straight to her brother, and laid both hands on his shoulder. Robert wrote you, she exclaimed, and her soft eyes shone through tears. Her brother nodded and drew her down to the chair beside him. What's the matter, Millie? he exclaimed softly. Mama wrote me all about it. Oh, you wonderfully wise boy, you. You're so good, so good. And you paid all those notes. You saved Robert's life, his whole existence, and Papa's life, too, I am sure. Hush, dear, it's all over now, and it's all right, said Wachner, looking over at Mueller. 
but the latter had tactfully subsided behind a railway guide which he was studying with apparent interest the evening passed off pleasantly although faulkner fell into a brown study now and then his brows wrinkling as if some problem were worrying him the old detective was chatty and cheerful but mila von weidner had known him only for a few hours so she could not realize that joseph muller seemed to have grown ten years older in the few short hours once he laid his hand on Wagner's arm and asked suddenly, "'They have a child, haven't they?' "'Who?' exclaimed Wagner in surprise. "'Lors.' "'Oh, yes, surely. A little girl who is blind? She is threatened with blindness. But how did you know that? The child had scarlet fever, which left her eyes very weak. They have taken her to Tony's mother up in the mountains for the summer.' "'Thanks, I must leave now,' said Mueller, rising. "'I must be getting back to Venice.' "'Where are you going? What are you going to do now?' why did you want to know about the lures a sudden uneasy fear tugged at faulkner's heart but muller did not answer he was already making his farewells to mrs von weidner and he soon slipped away into the outer darkness End of chapter seventeen